Good afternoon. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank, uh, 501c3, based in um, Philadelphia. Uh, this afternoon, our host, FBRI senior fellow John Noggle, who is also the head of the Haverford School, will be moderating a discussion with a distinguished panel, and the topic of today is assessing the troop withdrawal from Afghanistan. What is the impact of that, and what uh, what's the prognosis? Um, uh, Dr. Noggle is a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Army, and he's also the author of Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife, Counterinsurgency Lessons from Malaya and Vietnam. Um, before I turn it over to John, however, I just want to put in a plug for an upcoming event this Friday, May 14th at 10 a.m. We're having a program on cooperation, competition, and compartmentalization, Russian-Turkish relations and their implications for the West. That's going to be uh, hosted by Aaron Stein, who is FBRI's Director of Research and Director of our Middle East program. Um, we will be taking uh, uh, questions from the audience today, as always, and if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll also be putting uh, probably a map or two in the chat box, and do use the chat if you have any technical questions or need our assistance with anything. Uh, finally, I'd like to say thank you, a sincere thank you to our supporters and partners and members who, without whom we could not do these events. If you're not yet a member of that club, please consider becoming one. We greatly appreciate your support. Uh, John, take it away. Thanks, Raleigh, for those kind words and that soft sell. Uh, FPRI is a terrific organization, and I'm delighted that we are able to convene today's session on the future of Afghanistan with three extraordinary experts, one on the military and diplomacy, one on development, and one on the Taliban. Although, in fact, each of them knows a whole bunch about all of those things uh, in no particular order. Dr. Carter Malkasian is a senior researcher at the Center for Naval Analysis and was the special assistant for strategy to Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman General Joe Dunford from 2015 to 2019. Carter has extensive experience working in conflict zones. In fact, I met him in one. He spent nearly two years in Garmsar District of Helmand Province, Afghanistan, as a State Department political officer uh, and as a result of that experience, wrote the book, War Comes to Garmsar, 30 Years of Conflict on the Afghan Frontier, which won the silver medal in 2014 from the Council on Foreign Relations. I met Carter when he was an advisor with the Marines in Iraq's Al Anbar province. I only spent a year there. Carter spent 18 months. On July 1st, Oxford will publish his new book, The American War in Afghanistan, A History Pretty extraordinary timing on that one, Carter. Uh, uh, Oxford's publishing the book. He got his doctorate from Oxford and his undergraduate degree from Cal Berkeley. Jonathan Nash is the president and chief executive officer for Bluemont Incorporated, a global organization that helps people and communities around the world overcome challenges to create a foundation for progress. Before joining Bluemont two years ago, Jonathan served as the acting chief executive officer and the chief operating officer at the Millennium Challenge Corporation, a great organization, an American government agency focused on alleviating global poverty through economic growth, working in projects across Africa, Europe, Asia, Latin America, and the Pacific. Jonathan began his career as a Peace Corps volunteer in Honduras, he holds an MPA from Indiana and a bachelor's degree from Michigan. Uh, last but not least, Dr. Ashley Jackson is a researcher and author focused on conflict and arms groups, currently the co-director of the Center for the Study of Arms Groups at the Overseas Development Institute, and an associate researcher with the Conflict Security and Development Research Group at King's College London. Ashley has written extensively about the Afghan conflict and the Taliban, and her book comes out from Hearst this year, Negotiating Survival, Civilian Insurgent Relations in Afghanistan, also terrific timing. She's previously worked with both Oxfam and the UN Department of Political Affairs in Afghanistan. She holds a doctorate from King's College London and a master's degree from the London School of Economics. And she joins us from Norway, where the sun is still setting just because it takes forever for the sun to set in Norway. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions from each of these experts. We're going to uh, take questions from the growing 
uh, and always well-informed audience. Um, and uh, then we will uh, try to wrap it up. We're gonna start with Carter. And we're, I'm gonna ask Carter, what is your assessment of the status of the Afghan government and military as the United States prepares to withdraw? Um, thank you, John. Um, I'd say the status is um, a, a difficult one right now. I think when we had gone into Afghanistan and when we had surged in 2009, one of the goals was to enable the Afghan forces to stand up on their own. And it's quite questionable if they're going to be able um, to do that. And when I say the Afghan forces, I'm talking about the police forces that were built in every province, the Afghan army um, that operates throughout the country and has a more national foundation, and their special operations forces, their commandos, which are special operations forces, spent years carefully training and developing and are some of the better forces that are in Afghanistan. But since 2015, we've had ample evidence that the Afghan forces have great difficulty fighting on their own and holding back the Taliban. The reasons for this are multifaceted. Um, they seem very dependent on US airstrikes. In fact, when US airstrikes aren't available, we tend to see um, greater, greater defeats happen. This wasn't always the case. I think earlier on, uh, they, there was more examples of how they could fight well on their own, but over time, as defeat is piled upon defeat, their morale has gotten thinner, which has been a problem. Another reason for the problems they have is the corruption and leadership issues within the Afghan military and within the Afghan state, where many members of, of their ministry, many military officers, many police officers and politicians themselves um, are interested in making money off the people, are interested in taking bribes um, for people to be promoted, are interested in the, the policy of ghost soldiers, uh, where a unit will have a full roster, but those names won't actually be showing up to fight. The commander will simply be taking money for them and then giving, the, giving that money up the chain. Um, and that kind of corruption that doesn't always do well in terms of inspiring the average soldier, the average policeman to go fight. If they know that their leaders are more interested in pocketing money than caring about their welfare, that doesn't necessarily help. We could also point to some advantages that the Taliban have. The Taliban have suicide car bombs and IEDs. Suicide car bombs are horribly devastating devices. And if you, if you ever see the after effects of one, let alone the immediate effects of one, it is truly awing the amount of damage one can do and, and, and to life, limb, and structure. IEDs are very easy to implement, very easy to in-place. And if you're an Afghan soldier told to go retake a, a village that is laden with IEDs, you may well think twice. And the Afghan army and police, of course, do not have these similar capabilities, and it's probably for the best that they don't. We can probably sleep a little bit more comfortable at night knowing we didn't teach them or advocate that they be taught these kind of techniques. But there's also probably something deeper that's going on with the Afghan forces, something deeper about the difficulty of fighting for a government that has um, could be accused of being established by occupiers, a government that can be accused of being a, a puppet regime, um, that probably eats at the willpower of their of some at least some of their soldiers, probably makes it a little bit more difficult for them to be willing to go out and risk being killed or to go kill. Um, makes it more difficult for them to do those things than it is for the Taliban to do those things. It's a deeper issue related to identity and what it means to be an Afghan. Um, Recently, we've seen a larger number of setbacks. We've seen those setbacks uh, that occurred at the end of 2020, when we went down to about 4,500 troops where the Taliban were able to quickly gain ground in Helmand around Lashkar Gat and in the vitally important city of Kandahar, which is probably in terms of political importance, the second most important city in the country, where the Taliban were able to regain ground quickly sweeping aside Afghan forces. Um, Afghan forces gave up posts, had a difficult time counterattacking, and if that problem existed when we were still in the country at 4,500 troops, it's very likely to continue to be in the country when we go down to zero. So these are the kind of difficulties uh, that we're facing. Looking a little bit at the government side of things, I think the question we have to have is, will President Ghani be able to unite the government and the government's allies behind him to keep on fighting the Taliban? If he's able to, uh, to unite the Northerners behind him, the old elements of the Northern Alliance, um, to give him assistance and, and to, to not break apart their own way, then I think there's probably a 
chance of holding. If those things don't happen, the difficulties will be much greater. It hasn't been easy for President Ghani over the past few years. The negotiating process, uh, which is something that I've supported, has somewhat damaged his legitimacy. As the Taliban had been allowed to uh, be in Doha, to regularly meet with the international community, to sign an agreement with the United States, it does tend to paint them as a separate legitimate government to Afghanistan. And I'm not saying there's any way around that, or I'm not saying the negotiating process was, was wrong to have done, but it is a challenge that confronts President Ghani. So John, I th think that covers uh, some of the major points there. Thanks, Carter. Um, I, I'm reminded of the counterinsurgence dilemma, right? Uh, you, um, and we're, we're, we're getting great questions uh, already and we'll, we'll delve into this more, but if the government weren't weak, you wouldn't need an outside power to come in and try to prop it up. And of course, uh, in Afghanistan, we toppled uh, a government that uh, um, uh, was not weak, but was enormously cruel. And uh, we believe correctly in my eyes, inimical to, inimical to US interests. So the Afghan government is, is in trouble. The uh, Afghan security forces are uh, baiting, if not yet collapsing. What is your sense of what the United States can and will do to help both in the run-up to September and afterwards? Um, so there's a few things that can be done. And I, I should be clear at the beginning that many of these may not make a huge difference, um, but they are probably necessary to preventing them being outright collapse. You could still have collapse happen, but if you don't do these things, then the collapse is all the more likely to occur. Um, so one of them is maintaining funding to the Afghan National uh, Security Forces, um, which is gonna be somewhere in the range of 3 billion to 5 billion a year. Um, that needs to continue on to the Afghan forces. Without that kind of funding, they won't have the money to keep on having bullets, wages, the essentials to, to waging war. And I know that can sound painful to the American taxpayer. I guess I'm not, I'm, I'm agnostic in terms of advocating it or not, but the, the point to remember is that basically no Afghan government has done well in the history of Afghanistan without some kind of foreign support. And this is the big argument that Professor Tom Barfield makes. So it's just an important thing to keep in the back of our minds about, about funding. Second thing we can do is, is maintain the diplomatic effort, both towards pressing uh, for negotiations. I'm not terribly optimistic on negotiations, but if you know some degree of ceasefires that can occur, some concessions on the Taliban part are better than nothing. The other really important part to the negotiating effort is talking to the region, talking to the Russians, talking to the Chinese. Most of the region, I think, does have, have common interests in not seeing terrorism reform in Afghanistan. Um, so getting the region to can pressure the Taliban and make sure that happens, I think that's a very vital thing for us to do. And the region should have more interest in helping us now because we're leaving. Um, so we, don't, we shouldn't squander that opportunity. The next point, which is difficult but important, is maintaining a U.S. embassy. Um, because there's going to be some risk. We know what happened in Libya. Uh, and I think it's easy to see how we may be worried about maintaining an embassy. But without an embassy, it's going to be difficult to maintain the funds. It's going to be difficult for Congress or any member of an administration to say that they are credibly and carefully taking care of U.S. taxpayer dollars. Um, so for that reason alone, maintaining an embassy becomes um, vitally important. And I think those, are, those are the three points I would make as key things for us to keep on doing. Again, not guarantees that things are gonna go well, but if we don't do those things, they're probably gonna go a lot worse. The fate of that, that embassy um, is gonna require some State Department officials who are roughly as brave as you were uh, during your time in Garm, Sir Carter. I've got a lot of respect for those folks. I have a lot of respect for the State Department too. There you go. Uh, I also have a lot of respect for people who practice international development. Jonathan, can you tell us what that is? and what the changes in Afghanistan mean for your work there. Thanks, John, and, and thanks to FPRI for, for hosting us today uh, for this important discussion. So international development encompasses a lot of different efforts and, and, and ideas, but in short, it's about marshalling the resources, knowledge, and skills to help communities and individuals overcome the, the challenges that are holding them back. Typically, this occurs in, in lower-income countries, lower-middle-income countries, 
uh, in, in countries like Afghanistan. And so the international development community kind of works in and around that space uh, uh, with those working in defense uh, and in diplomacy. Uh, and the idea here is that the, the work that we're doing uh, is, is really to help uh, these individuals and community become more self-reliant, uh, to, to foster and create opportunities for economic growth. You know, uh, in the beginning, the World Bank estimates that in 2009, 100% of Afghanistan's GDP came from, from aid flows, from, from donor assistance. Uh, in 2020, it's around 42%. So there's been some progress over the years. It's been uneven in different areas. Uh, Blue Mont has been in Afghanistan since 2004. Uh, we've implemented about $1.5 billion worth of development projects for various donors, USAID, State Department, World Bank, others. Uh, currently, we're working on a project uh, to help uh, victims of, 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 of civilian victims of, of conflict and violence. And in fact, um, you know, right now we're working with the, with the families who, who suffered from that horrendous attack outside the girls' school in, in, in Kabul, uh, helping them to, to seek immediate assistance uh, through government services and then helping them rebuild and, and, and find opportunities for economic growth going forward. So, you know, we, we've, we've done a lot in Afghanistan, built, built roads, uh, worked in the Kandahar province, uh, helping uh, farmers move from uh, illicit uh, crops of, of poppies to, to other high income um, horticultural products. Uh, so th there's been a lot of progress made and, and, and frankly, um, you know, most of that is in, in jeopardy uh, going forward. And, and um, you know, I think uh, Bluemont and, and the range of other development partners that are out there working on a range of different issues, whether it's healthcare, uh, education, uh, infrastructure, uh, you know, capacity building of the government, uh, we're all kind of on pins and needles waiting to see what happens here. And, um, you know, I think the, the military withdrawal is already affecting the way that we work. We've pulled out the handful of, of Americans that we have working there that the vast majority of our, our team uh, out there are Afghani locals. Um, and, you know, we're also repositioning them. Uh, we've, we've moved them out of some of the ministries where they were working with Afghani officials uh, to help build their capacity to deliver these services on their own uh, because of some of the direct attack or direct threats of attack uh, on those ministries. So, so we've pulled back. Uh, you know, right now we're working in all 34 provinces, uh, which, is, which is pretty remarkable. Um, you know, when I look down the road and, and you know, as Carter laid out a couple different scenarios and a number of those scenarios, we're going to have to pull back substantially and, and, and focus our efforts uh, in, in communities and in provinces and areas where uh, the, the type of work and support we're providing is, is welcomed uh, and where it's safe for our staff to continue uh, to operate. So, um, you know, we are we are hopeful. We're, we're, we're planning for the best, but we're also uh, planning for the worst. And, and Obviously, we will continue to take our cues from the diplomatic community uh, and, and our USG colleagues in particular, uh, our clients uh, at, at the U.S. Embassy. Now, you're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of support uh, non-verbally from Carter, who I'm guessing has uh, worked with some of your folks um, in Helmand Province and, and, and other places as well. We may get him, uh, we may draw him out on that a little bit. How much of the work that you've done is irreversible? And, and how much of it is fragile and really dependent on a continued security presence? Yeah, that's, that's tough to say. I think, you know, it really varies by sector. Um, you know, a lot of the infrastructure that we've built over the years, we've seen that some of it has fallen into disrepair because uh, there weren't, for example, good road maintenance funds set up and, and, and capacity at the ministries to maintain that infrastructure. In, in other areas, we've made some real significant gains uh, in, in education and, and farming. You know, I think, um, you know, some of the programs that were directly focused on empowering women uh, um, both in terms of, you know, education, providing access to education, uh, to health, direct health care services. You know, we, we made a, a big effort, as, as have others in the development community, to, to hire a lot of Afghani women to go out there and, and be the face of our organization to work with Afghani women. You know, I think depending on uh, what happens with the Taliban and, and you know, Carter Nashley can speak to this better than I can. But, you know, for us, it's just not the Taliban. It's the other 20 or so odd armed groups that are, you know, seeking to, to destabilize the government as well as the various warlords looking to, to seize power in a vacuum or, 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 or take over new territory, you know, depending on, on where they go and what they do, I think, uh, you know, a lot of that progress could be repealed, particularly uh, the progress related to, to education uh, and women's access to, to certain services. Uh, 
but you know, I, I think a lot of the capacity that we have built among Afghani government officials, uh, and Carter makes a good point, you know, that we still know that there's a lot of corruption in a lot of these ministries, but a lot of that work we've done with them and, and, and empowering them, giving them skills, and, and some of that I think you just can't take away. And, and you know, whether those individuals will be able to put that to use um, as they are now or, or have previously, you know, that's, that's an open question, but, but we're hopeful that you know, not all the progress will be lost under a, a worst case scenario. And again, I think, you know, we and others may just have to retreat to certain parts of the country, probably the northern provinces, uh, to continue doing the work uh, that, that we've done in the past. But the end goal or the original goal, and so I hope the end goal is, is this idea of self-reliance and that really the Afghanis can take this over on their own uh, at a point in time. But that'll be certainly more difficult uh, under any kind of uh, regimes or, or in areas where uh, there's a, a great amount of control or, or, or power uh, that the, the Taliban and others are take over. And I, I think what we've heard already today is that, that uh, that's true for all of the three Ds, for defense, diplomacy, and development. The idea was, the objective was that uh, the Afghans would be able to handle those things themselves with pretty minimal U.S. support. And it does sound as if they're about to see pretty minimal U.S. support and we'll get to find out, uh, we'll, we'll return to that, and we'll get to find out uh, how successful our efforts have been over the course of nearly two decades. Ashley, we've uh, um, had, had a number of references to your subject area, in particular, uh, the, the horrific um, bombing of the Afghan girls' school uh, what Jonathan mentioned, one of the things that he's proudest of, I think, is the work that uh, Blumont has done in, in trying to empower Afghan women. That starts, in my opinion, uh, as an educator uh, with educating Afghan girls. I think that's one of the things that the United States is, is rightly proudest of. Did the Taliban conduct this attack? What's your, I mean, I, I know you don't know for sure, but can you talk to your assessment? You may know for sure. I don't want to. No, no, I, I claim no, no knowledge on that. The Taliban is, uh, obviously denied responsibility for the attack. Uh, they deny responsibility for a lot of attacks that we, we believe that they're behind, but they've instead blamed obliquely the Afghan government. Uh, the Afghan government, a lot of the population has blamed the Taliban. There are a lot of conspiracy theories kind of roiling around. And I think what it illustrates to me uh, is the shadowy nature of the violence now. You have a lot of actors orchestrating attacks, particularly in cities like Kabul against girls going to school, female judges, journalists, and so on, and no one claiming responsibility. Sure, we think that the Taliban are responsible for the vast majority of these attacks, but not all of them. There's a lot of opportunism, and you have in the cities particularly now, which were once bastions of government control, really these sort of safe spaces for things like journalists and civil society and girls going to school. Um, what you see now is that these things are, are under attack. And you know, if it, if it were only the Taliban um, that were the problem, I think you know, it would be less of a dire situation. But there are a number of armed actors, I think, who have an interest in curtailing women's rights, in using the deterioration of law and order and insecurity in government areas to you know, wage grievances, to uh, you know, profit to whatever. And of course, this is about a year after another horrific attack, not far from the girls' school on a maternity hospital. And I think what you're seeing with a lot of these attacks, they're so spectacularly horrific, is they, you know, they take advantage of, of this deterioration of, of security to terrorize the civilian population, to make people more suspicious, to aggravate ethnic grievances, tribal grievances, senses of exclusion and victimization. Just talking to friends and, and colleagues in Kabul, you know, it was really interesting to hear some of the reactions. One on one end of the spectrum was, you know, this is a genocide against the Hazara population. The UN won't call it that. The US won't stand up for us. What are we gonna do? And then talking to another friend was, you know, saying basically this happens all the time in Pashtun areas, but no one says anything. So you can kind of see through those two comments how this plays out into people's fears and, and you know, just the, the utter sense of hopelessness and victimization, which is really happening in all corners of the population, not just those that, that we see sort of attacked um, directly. But that's, you know, to, to answer your question, no one knows, and that's part of the problem. No one is ever held accountable for these, these kinds of attacks. That was cheery, Ashley. 
What is the Taliban's end state? What are they trying to accomplish? Well, I mean, they've had two pretty consistent goals. One, which they, they're very close to, to claiming credit for, is the exit of international forces, uh, the end of what they see as an occupation. The second goal is the establishment of what they see as a truly Islamic government. That's, that's the hard part. We were talking before about the counterinsurgents dilemma. This is the insurgents dilemma. This is the Taliban's dilemma. In a way, you know, the Taliban has seized a lot of territory, not only militarily, but through this strategy of creeping control. The Afghan national security forces and government presence in a lot of areas has kind of melted away. Uh, and the Taliban has really fought a war of attrition, you know, kind of eroded that presence. And in, in, that, in its place has set up this shadow government where they co-opt state schools, they use Sharia courts to sort of gain a foothold by meeting out justice, they sort of uh, win some level of support or at least consent to operate. Um, and so they've, they control to some degree this vast ways of territory, um, but that's not a government. That isn't easily transferable to a post-war state, in part because it's parasitic. It relies on what the international community built. It co-ops the clinics. It co-ops um, the, the, the schools. It taxes transit on the roads that USIAD largely funded and, and built. Um, and you know, if the US disengages, if other donors disengage, all of that disappears. 65 to 75% of the Afghan national budget over the past 10 years has been international aid. The Taliban will need some level of that to govern. Will it, will it get that if it doesn't play ball diplomatically? And does it understand that it won't get that if it doesn't make certain concessions? That's, that's really unclear. Um, I think an important caveat here is to say that the Taliban is not a monolith. I would never say that they're fragmented. But they're a diverse movement. You know, they've knitted together this patchwork of different armed groups and different alliances. And there are a lot of different views on the future within the movement. And strategically, when they talk about an Islamic government or an inclusive Islamic government, they haven't spelled out what that means. They haven't sort of said, and I think it's not because they're keeping some big secret. I think it's because they don't know. There isn't consensus in the movement about what this, this future government looks like. Um, and that in a way is both reassuring and slightly terrifying. Um, I don't think they expected troops to leave this quickly. I don't think they expected to be let off the hook, so to speak, uh, in negotiations, which they may or may not be, but it does look like negotiations have stalled at the moment and are in a very precarious situation. Um, and so, you know, they don't have a, a sort of blueprint behind the scenes, they, there's no consensus in the movements about what the what the future looks like if indeed they do sort of quote unquote win, uh, whatever that that means. So winning territorially, getting troops out is is one thing, but then what? Nobody knows. And it's not only because the situation is so fluid, it's because the Taliban hasn't had enough time, enough foresight, enough um, it hasn't had a peace process also to sort of see how it's going to govern. And I think that would have been for better or worse, um, helpful, not only to the Taliban in terms of thinking about the future and thinking about how to respons responsibly govern, um, but better for all Afghans to have an actual political process which accompanies troop withdrawal. We don't know if that will happen now. We don't know what kind of pressure or leverage the international community and specifically the US even has left or is willing to, to exercise over the Taliban. So that's a, a very vague, vague, uh, speculative way of, of answering your question. Uh, but also a, a consistently cheery one. Uh, I'm gonna stay with you, Ashley, and, uh, and, and ask uh, Stephen Katz's question uh, to you. Where does the Taliban get its money and military equipment from? That's a very good question. I think, you know, they have a lot of uh, different sources of financing. One is taxation, not least of all taxation, uh, and some sort of hand in the pot and the opium trade. Um, they have, over the past three or four years, built up an extensive taxation regime, which I would almost say is more effective than that of government, taxing, you know, 
wheat harvest, not only poppy harvest, taxing any transit on the road, taxing the import of perfume and cigarettes. I mean, it really runs the gamut of, of what they've been able to do in terms of their, their bureaucracy. Um, of course, they, they've received historically and, and currently support from neighboring states. Um, but when it comes to their weaponry and their technology, let's remember it's, it's really rudimentary. I mean, Carter talked about suicide bombs, uh, vehicle IEDs, these kinds of things. Um, a lot of what they do, you know, all the Taliban commanders I've met, you know, they, they don't have really shiny gear. They have old Kalashnikovs. They have, um, you know, they have enough equipment to wage clearly a war against a coalition of the world's most powerful armies, but they're doing that uh, in a way that doesn't necessarily require um, so much material in that in that respect. So I think uh, ultimately, of course, they also make a policy of trying to get ANSF who uh, quote unquote surrender, who they kidnap or coerce into switching sides to hand over their material. So a lot of- That's Afghan National Security Forces, which includes both police and military. Sorry, of course. Um, so a lot of, of what they do is, is you know, stealing from, from what we've provided and, and those kinds of things. That was slightly less depressing than your other answers, but only a little. It does not, it does not suggest that cutting off their supplies uh, will be enormously helpful. Uh, and it sounds like an awful lot of, of what they're receiving is self-funded um, through yeah. a, a pretty effective taxation system of theirs. So we've had enough of your cheeriness, Ashley. We're gonna turn to Carter uh, with the next question. Uh, 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 and uh, a question that uh, uh, purports to be uneducated, but I disagree. Why has Afghanistan seen such a long-standing series of unstable governments regardless of which of the world's major powers are trying to strengthen whatever government is currently in power? Um, it's a combination of reasons. Um, so if you go back, um, go back into the 20th century, go back even to the 19th century, um, the problem is that there's scarce resources. It's difficult for the government to garner enough resources to be able to pay for itself um, to control all of its territory. Um, that's compounded by the fact that there's lots of mountains and areas that are difficult for any singular government to gain control over. Um, it's also made worse by the fact that there's large numbers of tribes that are fractious um, and have different um, competing sources of authority um, that are hard for the government to get control over. It's for these kind of reasons that the, the government's traditionally depended on, on things like taxing the roads, taxing commerce coming in as a way of, as a way of getting money. Um, the, the scarcity of resources is, is shown by the fact that the government has rarely actually taxed its own people other than the commerce coming through because there just isn't enough money for them to do that without getting a large, uh, with, without getting revolts. So before 1979, um, the governments would look for aid from the Soviet Union and aid from the United States. They'd look for aid from the, from the British Empire. Um, and while they would never want to say that they were under the British Empire, um, they would be, they would happily take subsidies from them. Now, since 1979 with the Soviet intervention and then our intervention later on, these same kind of problems have persisted, but they've been worsened by the fact that the Soviets were actually in the country. And that generates a response, that generates revolt, that generates insurgency. Because part of Afghan identity, I would argue, is, is not having an occupier there. Now, this is probably an identity many, many countries have. So it's probably not something that's specific to Afghanistan. But if we want to understand why, since 1979, the countries haven't been able um, to run things on their own, it's partly the resource problem, and it's partly that either the Soviets have been in the country or we've been in the country. And it's made it that much more difficult. Yeah, um, antibodies are not just something our, we develop in response to Moderna or J&J. &J. Right, it, it's something that uh, um, people of many countries, but but the, the Afghans, I think, perhaps more than most, uh, take pride in, in resisting foreign invaders. So thank you for that, Carter. Uh, Jonathan, I'm going to ask you a question from James Garrett, uh, who who asks, um, who's, who spent some time in Afghanistan and had some some optimism, as I think many of us uh, who, who visited the country are struck uh, by the beauty of the country, uh, the stark uh, uh, beauty of the country. Um, but also the strength of the people and um, a people who have, have suffered for uh, under now 40 constant years of war. 
and, and really sort of deserve a break. Um, and, and James asks why the U.S. hasn't emphasized building the road infrastructure to tie the country together and weaken the tribalism that plagues the country. I know you've done some work building a road network. Has it been enough? And can you talk to some of the difficulties of that inherent in that? Yeah, thanks, John. I, uh, it's, uh, you're right. Our, our team in particular um, is, is amazed at the, the resiliency of the Afghan people and, and the communities and, and where we work. Uh, I mean, as we all know, Afghanistan is a, is a huge country. Um, and so you know, we were involved in, in connecting a number of communities through these roads. But again, it's, it's really the upkeep of the roads that, that's the most important. And it's such a capital intensive effort. So you could build roads, we could build more roads. Uh, but then there's the question of the maintenance and, and uh, the opportunity cost of pouring, you know, a million dollars per kilometer of road, uh, you know, pouring mil millions of dollars into that uh, at, at a million dollars per kilometer versus some of the, some of the other efforts. Um, but we certainly have seen, uh, and I think others have as well, not just on the roads where we we uh, were involved, but you know that that exchange of commerce and the connecting the communities can strengthen that that you know create some of that social cohesion that can help build resistance to some of the, these uh, other uh, you know the bad actors. Uh, but again, it's it's um, you know there's limited funds and 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 choices to make, and um, I, I think that's that's the challenge when when those who are allocating development assistance dollars, you know, do, do we go with you know high impact uh, you know, but, but relatively low dollar value projects versus, you know, some of the, these larger infrastructure projects, whether it's roads, power, water, and sanitation that provide the underpinnings of, of, of economic growth. I mean, those are the trade-offs that, that we have to make. And, and with ultimately, even, even though we've poured, a, or U.S. and others have poured a lot of development aid into uh, Afghanistan, um, you know, it, it's still not enough to, to, to close that gap. There, progress has been made, but, but the needs are vast. And, and perhaps always will be. Thank you, Jonathan, um, for that, that um, also cheery note. Um, we're, we're, we're running a trend across all the panelists at this point. I'm going to turn to uh, Ashley with a question from Mohammed Saroush, uh, who asks, uh, is the government of Afghanistan working together with the Taliban? What are the relationships like between the Ghani government and the Taliban? And, and, um, and, and, and how much of that can we understand? from the outside. Yeah, I mean, it depends really what you're talking about when you talk about the government. The, on the social service, sort of basic service delivery side, you actually have, have the health ministry guys on the ground uh, in direct contact with the Taliban negotiating access, making sure the health clinics still run, those kinds of things. There are these pragmatic kind of survival deals um, happening on the ground. And certainly between, in some areas, between Afghan forces, Afghan police, uh, you know, you'll you'll have this sort of tacit or you know, not even tacit, but clear system where the Taliban sets up their checkpoint at 4 p.m. Uh, when when the Afghan uh, security officials go inside, and they do that both again out of an interest for survival. Um, but if we're talking about peace negotiations, a power sharing deal, I think part of what the real problem was with the, the Doha talks um, that have recently sort of broken off is that neither side really thought they had to compromise. Neither side was really convinced that they had to make the necessary sacrifices to work with uh, and accept the other. And neither side was really convinced that a power sharing deal would work. Um, and so that makes me incredibly pessimistic but, you know, at the risk of, <laughs> dare I be optimistic about this, you know, Afghans have been fighting and forming political coalitions and power sharing deals for a very, very long time, for centuries, and are, you know, very politically savvy and expedient when it comes to recognizing that this is an incredibly diverse country in which winner takes all kinds of of political arrangements simply do not work. I think there are those in the Taliban and those on the government side who believe that they can still win, they can win militarily, but then there are the pragmatists who know that certain accommodations need to be made in order for there to be peace, in order for there to be some sort of stability. The problem still is, I think on both sides, is that they want it on their terms. So Ghani said, you know, he would accept um, 
certain things, he would step down from power if elections were held. But he said that full well knowing that the Taliban would never accept elections. So that's a very false fig leaf to be offering and a very disingenuous one. The Taliban certainly has, has sort of said, done similar moves uh, and, and jockeying. And I think that's that's the real problem is that you know we, were ne we never got to the point where these leaders on, on all sides um, came to the realization that they would have to sort of cede some of their ideals uh, and certainly some of their power to for the good of the Afghan people, for the sake of stability, for the sake of a political settlement, which unlike the Bonn Agreement in 2001, would include everyone. Um, I still am optimistic that, that that can happen. I'm probably one of the few people left who thinks <laughs> that, but that's the only hope I think that there is. Well, that, that's a change for you, Ashley, because you did in fact provide some hope that's good. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, send Sean Carberry's question to Carter, um, as, as he did. Um, given the history of the country, what evidence is there that suggests the Afghan elite can or will rally together and finally step up for their country? I'm not completely sure I agree with Sean's um, characterization there. I, I, I think it takes enormous courage to, to serve in, in any role in Afghanistan. I think of Ashraf, who I know, Ashraf Ghani, who I know slightly, uh, right, who, who could be living in comfort and, and peace in the United States, but is, has made uh, taken the enormous risk of, of deciding to serve his country. Uh, how well he's done it is, is a fair question, but boy, the, the degree of difficulty for this gymnastics routine is, is really, really high, right? Um, and and um, uh, perhaps more relevant uh, uh, to you, what, what can the U.S. do to facilitate the Afghan government doing what we wanted to do at a time when our leverage is presumably decreasing. On um, Sean, it's good good to hear from you. Th from you, thank you for the, the question. On um, will the Afghans come together or not? On um, and I guess we're really talking about the Afghans who are opposed to the Taliban. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to take it in that regard um, for this for this question. On. Um, it's hard to say if they're going to come together or not. So um, on one side, we could say that they're gonna have a common threat with the Taliban. And we can say that with the absence of the United States that they should be more motivated than before to come together and to put away the differences that exist. John, I'm saying on one side, I'll get to the other side in a moment. Um, so on one side, you could see that, and you could also point to uh, the ability of the Northern Alliance to finally come together at the end of the 20th century to at least stall the Taliban for some amount of time. Now, on the other hand, however, you could say that with the United States departing, that will increase the incentive for many people to leave um, because the likelihood of survival decreases. So that's going to be a contending on uh, a contending pending pressure. In terms of the Northern Alliance, how well are, how much are they going to fight? And how well the Northerners going to oppose the Taliban? There's some reason to question that. The first one is that they haven't done so well since 2015. I think that, I, I suspect everyone here would say that they're a little bit surprised how much ground the Taliban has been able to, to, to take or negotiate in, in the North. Uh, now, I wouldn't say that it's, uh, there were some reasons that this happened. But the degree to which the Northerners backed off or seem to have backed off to me is surprising. On um, the other factor that one can put here is that the, the, the folks that we are anticipating or we're hoping will fight and stand up and, and pressure the Taliban, not give up Kabul, they're also the ones who've been living in Kabul for the past 20 years. And several of my Afghan friends tell me that um, they'll say the Panchiris have become bourgeois. And what they mean is the Panchiris, the people who fought off Shah Massoud and were considered to be renowned fighters, they've lived in Kabul for 20 years. They've enjoyed the fruits of the government. They've enjoyed the, the spoils of our, of, of our aid money. And they're less willing now to fight. Now, I'm not saying that either side there is true. I'm just simply trying to lay out the various possibilities that exist here um, in the directions that things can go it's gonna be really hard for the United States to do much about this. Our diplomats, our embassy can try to pressure the Northerners to work with Ghani. We can try to pressure Ghani um, to not take positions that are too opposed to what the, uh, the Northerners want. But we've been doing that since 2014. 
Um, and with less forces on the ground, with less leverage, it may be more difficult for us to continue to do that. But I mean, it is what we can do right now. I think to a great extent, we'll be watching what is, what is going to be happening. Um, so I think I'll, 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 I'll stop talking to that point. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Carter. Uh, I wanna push uh, Carl's, Carl Gillis's question uh, to Jonathan. Um, and and uh, Carl asks about uh, the People's Republic of China, um, whether right to, to what role they are using uh, as they have in much of the world, uh, economic uh, instruments of power to uh, gain influence. Are, are they going to fill the gap? Is there going to be a gap? Do you see American development aid decreasing? Uh, do you see other countries stepping in or do you think the West is going to um, as, as it decreases spending on, on military assistance and, and military involvement, try to increase development assistance to replace that? That's a great question. Uh, you know, both at my time at, at Millennium Challenge Corporation, we were working across the globe, and then also, you know, in, in Bluemont, where we're working in a, a narrow range of countries, that, that we see the Chinese influence everywhere um, in the development space. Uh, it's a very different model of development. Uh, but at least in Afghanistan, what I can speak to is, you know, uh, we've heard from the Biden administration, and, and just last week, we were discussing with the U.S. Embassy and, and USAID in particular, they are committed to continuing to uh, send development aid and, and development assistance to Afghanistan. And in fact, in many ways, they are indicating that they're gonna accelerate uh, some of the assistance they're, they're, they're planning on uh, and increasing the budgets of some of the programs that they've already indicated as a sign uh, to the Afghan people that, that the US is not retreating entirely. Now the question will be, they could send the money, but the question will be, can actors like Blumont and others actually implement uh, and, and have the kind of impact that we all wanna see? But certainly uh, there are lots uh, of other actors, PRC and others that are, are, are looking to see where they can gain an edge on the ground. And, and this is not obviously just in Afghanistan, this is, this is across the board, everywhere where uh, we're involved in development assistance. But at least at this sign, the signals we're getting from uh, the embassy and USAID in particular is that they're not backing off at all. In fact, in many ways, they're gonna double down on, on the kind of uh, funding for uh, development, uh, international development and, and, inter and, and assistance uh, of the kind that we've been doing recently. And Jonathan, do you know the, the sort of order of magnitude um, number Some of the projects that are on the business forecast for USAID range up to you know 100 million dollar projects. Now these aren't the kind of 400, 500, 600 million dollar projects that we saw back you know in, in 2009, 10, and and, and 12, 11, 12. Uh, but but certainly uh, the, the kinds of projects are looking at many of them. Uh, are, are focused on, on entrepreneurial, uh, kind of helping to stimulate the, the private sector economy. Uh, you know, obviously th there's been a lot of focus on, on ag and, and health uh, to date, but is there a way that, 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 that the investments can be made, uh, you know, and, and, and build these communities and that kind of opportunities uh, to provide some of that social cohesion and, and peace building we need to see to actually see these communities uh, move forward. But uh, certainly uh, much in terms of order of magnitude, much larger development aid flows than we're seeing in, in a number of other countries in the, in the region, including Pakistan and, and Iraq and, and elsewhere. Uh, and we're going to turn to, to Pakistan in, in just a minute. I'm going to throw that to Carter, but first I'm going to go to Ashley uh, and, and refer Carl's question to you. What is the role of the Islamic State in Afghanistan? Could they seize power or will the Taliban tolerate their presence? Um, yeah, that's a good one. And I think one where there's not a lot of great information, a lot of speculation. I think what we do know is that uh, the Taliban is vehemently opposed to the presence of the Islamic State. Um, it has somehow coordinated with U.S. forces to, to fight the Islamic State in the East. I think that's, that's come out of U.S. official sources have confirmed that. Um, and so, you know, in the future, I think you do have a potential for the Islamic State to, to grow and, and resurge. Um, it's much weaker than it once was a few years ago, but I say that there is the potential for it to make a comeback simply because you could see the Taliban, uh, if they entered into peace negotiations or a power sharing deal, which is the optimistic scenario at this point, you could see, you know, hardliners. What's the pessimistic? What's the pessimistic uh... <laughs> That's that it just keeps it keeps getting worse and there's no you know there's no no political deal um so the optimistic uh, <laughs> uh scenario is that you do have a political settlement but you have hardliners who feel alienated by that peel off 
join join the Islamic State such as it is. Um, but right now, it really only exists in in the east of the country. There are reports of of cells in the north and elsewhere, but to me, they're not terribly credible. When um, the Islamic State has tried to recruit Taliban commanders in the past, the Taliban has cracked down, beheading, executing certain commanders who they feel have been disloyal. They've really taken a hard line on that, but. You know, if there is a security vacuum, if there is no one political actor able to establish a monopoly uh, on violence, if there is no political settlement, I think then you can see groups like the Islamic State, you can see groups like Al Qaeda and the Indian subcontinent and other groups really find a home once again in Afghanistan. So that's, I think, the real danger if you if the war continues, escalates, mutates, and there is no there is no stable national government. And that's probably worst state, worst case for the United States. It's the Islamic State for, for, for everyone, really. I think that's the worst case scenario for the power sharing. Uh, but the good news is that Pakistan is uh, a completely benign actor in Afghanistan and will continue to be going forward. Isn't that right, Carl? Um, Pakistan is a country with many interests in Afghanistan. I mean, for the general audience here, I, this is, many of you probably know this already, but Pakistan is very concerned about what happens in Afghanistan. Afghanistan because it's worried about its situation with India and it worries about if India forms an alliance with, with Afghanistan or has influence in Afghanistan that they'll be able to do damaging things within Pakistan itself and they have some cause for fear of this on um, the Ghani government and the Karzai government had close relations with India on um, and there's Indian consulates there's a small amount of Indian development work so these feed Pakistani um, fears. Um, and the, within Pakistan itself, there is a certain sympathy within certain uh, segments of the population and certain segments of the military for the Taliban and what the Taliban um, have been trying to do. And they've had a relationship with the Taliban for a long time, and that makes it difficult for them to break with them. Um, in terms of immediate policy, I think we saw some degree of softening of the Pakistani stance in late 2018 through early 2020. During this period of time, they were somewhat helpful with negotiations. Now, I don't mean that in terms of they were trying to shut down the Taliban or push the Taliban out of Pakistan. That certainly was not happening. But they were fairly helpful in getting Baradar released out of house arrest to be to run um, the, the, the Taliban, uh, to be the deputy for the Taliban for political affairs and to run uh, their office in Doha. Um, and, he, and so that was helpful to getting things moving on the negotiating side. Also, it appears at a variety of points, they um, at least encouraged the Taliban to do things like um, accept a ceasefire before the 29th February 2020 um, signing of the, of the pact, um, and a few other points doing some encouragement towards the Taliban. So that was helpful. Since, um, since about October of last year, the Pakistanis, from my observation, have been less helpful. Now, I'm not seeing everything. So they could still be being helpful, and I don't know it. But from my observation, um, they've repeatedly said that the United States um, don't expect help from Pakistan on negotiations. This is something between the Afghans to settle. Don't look to us for help. They have also said at times when the Taliban weren't going along with parts of the uh, parts of the, of the peace agreement, that the United States needs to adhere to the February 2020 peace agreement, um, implying the United States needs to get out by May. Um, so the fact that lately they haven't, they haven't stated that they're going to be willing to apply pressure or encouragement towards the Taliban to reach an agreement I, makes me a little bit worried about the future. Sure. There have also been a variety of statements um, in the Pakistani press and by Pakistani leaders, such as former ISI leaders, that um, Pakistan and the ISI defeated the Soviet Union. Now Pakistan and the ISI have defeated the United States. Um, so now those are just random statements in the press that I probably shouldn't have said, but they're probably a little bit too inflammatory. Um, but those are some of the reasons I have a little bit of concern about how Pakistan is going to react um, following our withdrawal. And the, the question of, of Pakistan, its interests, um, its control of its nuclear weapons arsenal, its proliferation of its nuclear weapons arsenal is a subject that fascinates me and that we will delve into in a different FPRI event. Before then, we've got a lot of ground to cover in six minutes. Jonathan, we've got two infrastructure questions for you. One is the status of the Ring Road, which I know is essential to what you do. 
and want to continue to do in Afghanistan. And the other is the status of the airport in Kabul, which I know not as well as you do, but reasonably well. And uh, the questioner believes that it may be getting worse without Turkish security to safeguard it. Over to you. Yeah, yeah thanks for the uh, question. Uh, obviously, both both sets of infrastructure are critically important to to, to having a fully functioning economy and, and, and government and and you know uh, Afghan people being able to get around. Uh, we're Bluemont isn't as closely involved with the roads these days. Uh, that that project wrapped up a few years back, so I'm not as up to date on the actual status of of the ring road, but we were involved in constructing a, a fair bit of that. Um, with the airport, Bluemont and a lot of the other uh, development actors are, are very concerned about uh, being able to get our people in and out safely uh, as, as uh, the airport, uh, you know, goes back to the Afghan control. Um, so, you know, that's, that's yet another reason that contributed to our um, thinking around evacuating our, our expats and, and Americans for now to see kind of where this, this settles out. Uh, but, you know, we were hopeful that there may, that, that the government will be in whatever form uh, able to continue to maintain a, a, a safe, fully functioning airport that meets international security standards. Uh, because if they don't, that, that just will make it even more difficult for for us and, and others and, and you know, U.S. government to continue to, to move uh, in and out of and around uh, Afghanistan. Thanks, Jonathan, and thanks for your work in building that ring road on which I've traveled some miles. Carter and Ashley have traveled four miles, I think, on it than I have. And we've got um, uh, right, um, folks folks um, noting the importance of roads. I used to say when I talked about Afghanistan that where the road ends, the Taliban begins. Of course, that's no longer the case. Now the Taliban uh, right, owns a, a whole bunch of the roads uh, a whole bunch of the time. And as, as Ashley is too young to remember the old uh, Warner Brothers cartoon of uh, the Wiley e. Coyote and the Roadrunner checking in and punching their time clocks at the same time. Uh, that, that's sort of what I see happening now between the Taliban and some of the Afghan security forces. The Afghan security forces leave it in good order at 4 p.m. for the Taliban to own the checkpoints at night. That's my cheery thought. Um, I'm, I'm, I wanna, for Ashley's, um, I'm gonna give uh, each of the, um, e each sort of a, a chance, a uh, closing um, statement. I'm gonna give a prompt to Ashley and, and let Carter and, and Jonathan give their own as we look toward the future. Uh, I, I hinted at, at worst case, which in, in my eyes would be a Taliban retakeover of the Afghan government. I think you also think that that and perhaps in conjunction with the Islamic State would be the worst case. Do you think that would look appreciably different than it did prior to 2001, Ashley? Or what is, what is your vision for what that would look like? That's a tough one because there's so many unknowns right now about how exactly that would occur. Um, you know, if you'd asked me two months ago, I would have said there's a one scenario in which the Taliban is the dominant player in a government uh, that includes other Afghan factions and that there has been a slapdash kind of peace negotiations that puts sort of a veneer of legitimacy on that and it's fragile, but it holds. That now is, is I think, increasingly unlikely with the, the sort of faltering of, of the Doha negotiations. It's still a possibility. Um, but I think what the Taliban will try to do is try to peel away, and they're already doing this, they're trying to peel away the various factions that have underpinned the, the Ghani government and the Karzai government before that. Carter talked about the sort of northern players, people like Atta and others in the north who have, you know, still have legitimate political constituencies. They're savvy political operators. They have no real allegiance to Ghani. Ghani tried to, to remove Atta, has tried to really confront a lot of these figures. And they think maybe they can strike a deal to have their own kind of fiefdoms within a Taliban regime. And I think the Taliban is not necessarily opposed to that. I think they, you know, they fought a lot of these guys over the decades since the civil war. Um, and, and so there's a, a relationship and a, I, I can see sort of horse trading occur that way. And I think the Taliban would prefer to form a coalition of, of that kind rather than deal with civil society or rather than deal with human rights and all these kinds of, of, of other ideas. I think they're more comfortable in sort of um, piecing together some alliances on the ground. I don't think there are many within the Taliban ranks who, 
you know, would willingly storm Kabul, right? I, I don't think that their sort of dress rehearsals and taking the cities in, in Kunduz and elsewhere have gone particularly well. The Afghan army still has a pretty powerful air force, which has dented their ranks. Um, so they're going to try and do it through the method by which they have taken most of the country. And that is a mixture of, you know, these sort of hit and run attacks, uh, suicide attacks, attacks terrorizing the civilian population, um, and this strategy of creeping control. You know, you have shadow courts administrating justice in the outskirts of Kabul. You know, you have the Taliban taxing in the outs, you know, 10 minutes from where I used to live in Kabul. So, you know, while the government is still present, the Taliban is, is creeping in, softening the ground, and it's a much smarter strategy than trying to sort of uh, take things by force in the sort of nightmare scenario that I think people are envisioning. But, you know, the scenario I'm outlining is no less, uh, no less uh, dreary in a lot of, a lot of respects. Uh, and again, that is the more optimistic scenario the, the really pessimistic one, the really dangerous one for Afghans, as well as the US, is if there is no one actor who's able to exert control, if you just see these parties fracture, if you see more militias being raised, if you see the Taliban splintering, that could have absolutely disastrous consequences for Afghans, for the region, and for US security interests as well. And I mean, the, on that cheery note, I will hand <laughs> it back to you. But, but I think, again, I think that's the worst case scenario and not the most likely one at this point. Yeah. Mem memories of the, the aftermath of the Soviet withdrawal and uh, the Taliban in, in many ways was a blessing uh, to the Afghan people who suffered even worse under the warlords who, who were fighting a civil war over the country before. Uh, Carter and Jonathan, I apologize. I lied to you. We are out of time. This has been a terrific discussion. Uh, I'd like to invite Ashley and Carter to get back in touch with FPRI. We'd love to host, I can't speak for the organization, I would love to host uh, discussions of your books when they come out. Jonathan, we, we focus too much, I think, um, in this series on uh, defense and not enough on uh, development as a, an important tool of American foreign policy. And so we hope to invite you back for more discussions as well. With that, uh, I, I, I just like to say this has been one of my favorite um, uh, sessions of the mainline briefings. On behalf of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, our sponsors, our friends, thanks to all of our panelists and to everybody for asking such terrific questions and uh, a fond hope that sooner than later we'll be able to gather in person to do these again. Thanks to every one of you. <laughs>